You are listening to The Edge, a podcast for personal development junkies and visionaries living right at the precipice of oh shit meets fuck yeah. I'm Nadia Munda, an embodiment and relationship coach and a lover of all edges. Stick around to listen to raw, unpolished conversations where we explore our personal and collective edges in all their erotic glory. Hello, everyone. Today's episode is one that I feel might end up becoming quite a few drawn out episodes, but I want to start with the big picture here and I want to talk about something that I've been a little bit more hesitant to talk about simply because I think that we can start to take anything to an extreme and hate on pretty much any trend. And so I know for the past year or so, there's been quite a lot of haters hating on the coaching industry. And as someone who is a coach, I obviously believe in coaching. That goes, hopefully, without saying that the power of coaching in my world, in my life as a client, has been more potent than any other type of healing, therapy, personal development that I've done. So I strongly believe in it. I have seen results in my own life and also obviously in my clients, and therefore I'm a huge proponent of coaching as a modality. With that said, when we take any industry, when we take any trend, when we take any uh, subculture, what always ends up happening is there's going to be extremes and there's going to be shadow and there's going to be weird as fuck trends. And so today I really want to talk about what I'm calling the prosperity preachers of the coast coaching industry. So when I refer to the prosperity preachers, it's actually a, a concept, a terminology that comes from the megachurches that were and still are pretty popular. I feel like a lot of them started to rise up. Okay, this is not a history lesson and don't quote me on this, but you know, somewhere in the 80s, Maybe they started in the 70s and sort of like got bigger and bigger, 80s, 90s. And if you think about it, there's such a parallel. Just literally when you look at footage of mega church uh, sessions, you know, like Sunday, uh, oh my gosh, what do they call it? (laughs) Sunday service. (laughs) I'm not a Christian, so I have no idea. (laughs) Like, what are the terms here? And... um, when you look at footage of megachurches like Hillsong, and then you look at stadiums at a like you know a Tony Robbins event, for example, and I'm not like specifically pecking on him, but you know he's the the big symbolic name that we all know, right? We they look the same. Like I wouldn't, you could have shown me footage of. Hillsong or a Tony Robbins event, and I wouldn't know which is which unless there was like a cross on stage or it was clear who was the speaker. And so um, I think just that alone as an image should be a telltale sign of how much we are paralleling things in the personal development world. So Prosperity preachers were essentially this concept in the mega churches where it was like, okay, please give us a thousand dollars for your vow of faith, right? Where there was this like, you must pledge a certain amount of money in order to prove your spirituality, in order to prove your devotion. And then, of course, as we all know, those prosperity preachers lined their pockets with it, went, bought Rolexes, bought sports cars, uh, did not use 
the money for charity, that's for sure. And it was a business. It was basically a business. And I will give credit to, I think, the difference between the coaching industry and churches is that churches are not technically supposed to be a business. They, they pretend not to be a business, but the coaching industry pretty much is like, I'm a business, right? Like we're not, when we have a coaching practice, we're not pretending that we're taking all of our clients' money and giving it to charity. But with that said, there is that same strategy of going, if you are in like, if you believe in yourself enough, if you believe in, you know, quantum leaping, if you believe in, you know, divine manifestation, you'll put down $20,000 to, you know, manifest this next course and make a million dollars, blah, 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 you know, all that rhetoric that we're all, we're all so bored of. And yet, we all on some level buy into it, myself included. We all buy into it. And that's the part that is really, that I get curious about, right? I'm like, what is it about human nature that has us feeling like we need to somehow connect money to purity, to connect abundance to alignment like what is it in our systems that has us feel this way because there's something that all these different institutions and industries are playing on and pulling from there's something in our psyche in our human nature in our conditioning and programming that essentially if you pull apart the labels oh this is you know an australian megachurch or oh this is a community of a influencer coach or this is you know the orgasmic meditation community or this is uh you know rajneesh osho's whatever I forget the name of the community and what they called it. Or like, hey, Nexium, right? Like, I mean, we can just go down the list of essentially a bunch of cults and also other personal development communities that teeter on cult behavior. They may not fully be a cult, but they, whether consciously or unconsciously, do use certain guidelines from the cult playbook, so to speak, uh, that if you just, again, pull away the labels and just look at what's actually happening, there is a lot of similarities. And it's like, it's a little spooky to see how much there's similarities. And I want to say ultimately, you know, before I dive in a little, be, little bit deeper into this, that first I want to credit a couple of sources that have been really inspiring my thoughts around this. One is like the, there's the Netflix documentary, How to Be, what is it? How to Be a Cult, How to Become a Cult Leader, something like that. Um, and that's really interesting because it goes into the strategies and the tactics. And so some of what I'll talk about today will be um, inspired and pulled from there. There's also a few different. Uh, and there's a lot of accounts online that are questionable because on the one hand, they're calling out some things that I also see that I go, hmm, yeah, this could be, this seems problematic. I'm, I'm a no to this. But then there is a way in which any sort of extremism uh, then becomes problematic too. So when they are, hmm sort of blanket hating on everything it it i have a hard time also trusting their credibility and their lens because they're now villainizing the coaching industry as a whole and the truth is it's somewhere in between right like i'm a coach i have always said that I have no problem with the label coach. I always would like to be a coach. Life may have other plans for me, but 
if it were up to me, I would be a coach till the end of time because I freaking love coaching and I see the power of it. And coaching has gotten a bad rep. The same way that you can argue that Christianity has gotten a bad rep, right? Because of the rampant amount of sexual predators in leadership positions, but that doesn't mean every single pastor, preacher, priest is bad, right? So when we dive deeper into this discussion, I really want to frame this piece, like in the context of I'm not shitting on the coaching industry, I'm not leaving the coaching industry, I'm not suggesting that no one hire a coach, And I'm also not suggesting that you go into this blind going like everyone's great and doing the thousand dollar, the parallel version of the thousand dollar vow of faith that the prosperity preachers essentially were asking of their followers. And what is that? I mean, what does it look like in the coaching industry? One example, and this is sort of extreme, but one example is those like crazy ass mystery offers, right? Where they're like, for two, 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 you pay me and you'll get something with me at some point about something. (laughs) And people do it. Like, what are you even buying? Like you're buying a box that may have nothing in it, but the box maybe says Chanel on the outside or something, you know, the influencer coach's name on the outside. And so you feel good. They also use tactics, whether consciously or unconsciously. I think a lot of these tactics, by the way, as like a side note, just to asterisk this is like, a lot of these tactics aren't necessarily conscious. Sometimes we're learning things from other people, and then we sort of regurgitate it without critical thinking. And I think this is the big thing here is like, we need to, I mean, critical thinking is what keeps you from being in a cult. I remember once having a teacher Side note, sidebars. There's going to be a lot of sidebars here. You know me, I have like 17 tabs open in my brain at all times. As a side note, I have had quite a few teachers, but one in particular that comes to mind who, one of the only male teachers I ever had, who was giving me shit for questioning things. And um, I was like, yeah, this questioning, I'm sorry, it bothers you and challenges you, but this is what has kept me from being in a cult. And I've seen cult-like behavior in uh, people close to me. And I have seen how blind faith has ruined people's lives. And so... Yeah, I'm going to ask questions. Sorry, it bothers you. And so I've had quite a few people say that I'm not necessarily the easiest client sometimes because I ask a lot of questions. That's true. I do. I don't just go like, yeah, this strategy, cool, let's do it. Um, Because... I take some time to sit with it, to look at it from all angles, to feel it in my body, to feel it in my heart, to feel it in my gut. Does this feel true? Does this feel aligned? Does this feel uh, like my truth and something that's going to be good? And I think this is really important for us when we are navigating uh, the wild, wild west, which is the coaching industry. And we see we're now in the chapter of the wild wild west where because there's no good regulatory practices because we are and there's beautiful like freedom to that by the way right like you don't even need to be certified to be a coach there's a good side of that there's a bad side of that and we're now in the phase where everyone's dropping like flies (laughs) because people are starting to realize that there was a lot of manipulative tactics, again, a lot of which were unconscious, right? Because we have to remember that systems infiltrate through us and then come out of us, not even intentionally. So I am not pointing fingers at particular individuals, 
I have a very strong belief that all people are trying their best with the information that they have and the tools that they have. But unfortunately, we are conditioned and programmed by systems that are evil. So to me, I don't believe that any human's evil. I believe systems are evil. I believe systems are what hold darker energies. And it is systems that hold the shadow of humanity and our collective consciousness. And those systems are institutionalized religion, capitalism, patriarchy, racism, ableism, and so on and so forth, right? Like all of these are systems that keep the underdog powerless. And I, and I am sure you listening, uh, are champions of the underdog. And we don't want that. So all the people who are using these tactics, to a certain extent, are doing it unconsciously. Now, I'm not excusing every single bit of behavior, I do think that, yes, at some point we should be self-aware enough and accountable enough to take responsibility and to understand what is okay for us as leaders to be doing and to be modeling and to be embodying. So the first thing that we should not be doing is equating someone's investment with their spirituality oh, well, you're not trusting your higher self enough or you don't believe in yourself enough if you don't put down 20K for this next program. Really? What about if you have four kids, you're a single mom, and you have a lot of other priorities and you're being responsible and you are making sure that your kids are going to have a school fund and be fed and that the car is running and like, Does that mean you don't believe in your higher self? There's a level of privilege in that rhetoric of if you don't put down the money, you are not high vibe enough. You don't believe in yourself enough, right? Like all of this shit is so damn manipulative. And absolutely unacceptable. It is a standard we need to set in the industry that this this conversation should not be had. The subtle or not so subtle equating of, oh, if you didn't invest in yourself, that means you're not vowing, you're not betting on yourself. I don't know about that. That's not to say we can't ever take risks and we can't ever bet on ourselves. Of course, like everything is nuanced and somewhere in the middle. You've been listening to the podcast for a while. You know that that is always my stance on pretty much everything. The more I go through life, the more I realize that's what it is. Everything is in nuance. Everything's in subtlety. So... If you are ever in a position where you find a sales page, a story on Instagram, an email, or a conversation with a coach or a leader of some sort, somehow connecting your money and making meaning of it, like, oh, this is connected to how much you believe, how much you trust, how much you are in alignment, which by the way, it's also the reverse, (laughs) right? It's like, oh, if you are, you not only do you need to pay, right, to prove that you are quote unquote in alignment, also if you're not making money, you're not in alignment. How cute is that? Nothing like shaming someone into believing they are wrong or broken, which then, of course, just has them go back into investing even more, right? And that's how people get broke. (laughs) That's how people get bitter in the coaching industry, the clients, because that's what's happened. 
And this to me like ties very much into like purity culture and perfectionism. And it's like so rampant in the spiritual and personal development world, this idea that like I must cleanse my, like, okay, so the Christian version, right, or any religious version sort of like cleanse my soul, cleanse my soul, cleanse my existence, like. Hi, love. Just wanted to take a moment out of this conversation to let you know there are so many ways to start your embodiment and intimacy journey. It is not necessarily having to work privately in a coaching container with me. There is a whole page on NadiaMunla.com under the tab self-study that is dedicated to anyone who's looking to just start their journey. So whether it's an embody at home class that you want to start to bring into your morning or evening routine to just move the energy, to explore your different feminine archetypes, or maybe it's something in the world of intimacy and sexuality. I've got master classes from everything around energetic sex to exploring monogamish type relationships and lots, lots more. So definitely go take a look at the page, nadiamala.com, and then go to the tab that's self-study. And for those of you who are here on this podcast listening, I've gotten so many DMs from beautiful devoted listeners sharing with me how much of an impact these conversations have had and I really just wanted to give back the love with a special 50% off code so if you go to the checkout on any of the classes that are there and you put in podcast love all one word in the coupon code on the check on the way out right you will get that 50% off as a thank you from me i am so fired up around the topic of embodiment and intimacy that i can't not nudge you in the direction of actually getting into the practices and that is the place to start so definitely go check that out and of course if you do want to work privately with me always that is always an option just shoot me an email nadia at nadiamunla.com let me know what you're looking for everything from you can start with a single session and if you let me know you're from the podcast I'll give you 50% off on that single session as well and so we can talk more about that over email so either dm me at nadiamunla.com on instagram or shoot me an email nadia at nadiamunla.com I will see you there now back to the episode. Like all these things, these ways in which it's like, I am not clean and I must do things to cleanse myself and to be better. And it shows up in the coaching industry very similar, where it's like, put down more money and you will be more cleansed. Um, do more programs, you will be more cleansed. Like, there's just all these ways in which there's always another place you need to go. I mean, the amount of clients who've come to me who are like, I am a, a crazy consumer. Like, I am addicted to buying online courses and programs. And whenever I hear that, I always go, I really hope that we can work together to end that. Because that is what a good coach is, is someone who gives their client the tools to be sovereign and to feel empowered versus the systems that suck, is what I'll call them, the systems that suck, um, they create dependency. And if you think about the history of marketing, right? It, again, I'm not historian and don't quote me on exactly this, but it's something along the lines of, you know, someone very smart uh, created this idea of we must, we must create a desire and hunger in people in order to sell them things instead of just, so that they're not just connected to their needs. They are We're now creating desire. I mean, I see this. I am a prime example of like, I'll pop on Instagram and then I'll get targeted ads for things that 
two minutes before that I didn't need and then suddenly I'm like, oh my God, I have to have this gadget. It seems so cool. That is a prime example of a desire that was literally created in that moment through the marketing. And so with our own life, I mean, that's what coaching is about. It's like life coaching, right? We are trying to better our lives and better the experience of our lives. And so when we teeter into perfectionism, into what like our version, our new age version of purity culture, what are we really doing here? There's a hierarchy again. There's a place to go. There's like, there's a never ending slew of, okay, well, I did level one of, you know, I don't know. I'm just going to throw out names. Ista, now I got to do level two. Now I've got to do landmark and do the next thing. And if you look at like Nexium, um, that like personal development cult, right? That was such a big, I don't know, like a big topic last year, the year before uh on that show there was many shows about it actually but the one that made them famous was the vow and in that same thing right there's like all there's always like okay you pay for this and then it's like okay well you only get this far now to be an even better person you need to pay for this other thing and then you need to pay for this other thing and you need to pay for this other thing and it just gets you it hooks you in but what is it that's hooking you in it's simply the belief that you are not enough that you gotta be better. And it's a tricky situation because it's not one or the other. We shouldn't just sit on our asses and not try to be better. It's good to be better. But when do we teeter into perfectionism, purity, and not enoughness? And I think that's just a question. It's a constant inquiry. There's no answer. There's no like, this is the line. It's an individual experience. It's a personal inquiry where you have to sit down and go, okay, when is this starting to harm me instead of helping me? At what point is my belief that I can be a better person something that is upgrading my life versus something that's making me feel like shit about myself? And that's just something to, to, to think about. Because if you're buying all these courses and taking all these programs and all that's happening is you're losing money, and you're thinking you're broken because you're not making it. When in fact, there's two systems that are essentially fucking you. I don't know how else to tell you this. It's not about the person who sold you the program, though they are probably, you know, they're not helping the cause. But it's about two systems trying to fuck you. And what are those systems? It's capitalism and, you know, essentially the consumerism. The consumerism, like, ethos and culture of capitalism. And uh, this idea of I must always be better, right? So, like, again, I'll just call that, like, perfectionism. So you're, you're getting screwed by systems, and they're both working in partnership essentially to continue the cycle i'm not perfect enough i'm not pure enough okay i'm going to spend more money i'm not this enough I'm not... and think about it it's the same thing like the makeup industry or you know the plastic surgery industry or i don't know i'm just thinking about women's bodies because that's the first thing that came to mind because we do the same thing with our physical bodies we make them projects oh my eyebrows are not you know thick enough by the way, 20 years ago, our, all of our eyebrows were not thin enough. Joke's on us. <laughs> who created, who creates these trends? Like what? Suddenly it's like, I remember in the 90s, we were all trying to have the rainbow uh, Archie, not Archie, what do you, like the like round eyebrows. And then now everyone wants the bush, the Frida Kahlo, just with a little bit of space in between. Like what, you know? And now we're just like painting thick eyebrows on because we all pluck them and have no more hairs from the 90s. Like, it's just, these are things that like, when we zoom out and look at it, we're like, what is even happening? We are total puppets, but we are puppets, not of other people. We are puppets of these systems. 
where it's like, oh, this year it's bell bottoms, next year it's the teeny tiny skinny jeans, and then now it's this and now it's that, and we just have to go by so that we can keep up. And then there's more like skin thingies that you got to do. And I mean, it's just like a never ending, never ending process. The rat race, you will never win. The joke is on us until it isn't. If we lift the veil and we look at the bullshit that is being sold to us, we can opt out. And that doesn't mean boycott the coaching industry, never hire another coach, be an asshole and cancel coaches who somehow got sucked into the world of uh, commodifying spirituality. Because that's what's happening. We're commodifying our purity. We are commodifying our worth. We are commodifying are we good enough? And we just can choose not to. And we can still choose to better ourselves, to have guides, to have elders, to have coaches, to have therapists. That's all beautiful. If it's going to help you to learn about why you do things a certain way as an adult because of your childhood, or if it's really good to learn new ways to communicate with friends or family or a lover or a partner, that's upgrading your life. But when you're starting to use weird words and concepts to shame and blame the other or yourself or to somehow re-emphasize and reiterate the hierarchy of I am better than you because you invested in this or you use this language or you have X number of crystals. I know I just take it from like, you know, where we are to like, how absurd it can start to get. Then we start to realize, like, oh, wait a second. This is, this is weird. This is weird. We initially got into personal development. I want to orient us back to the beginning. Why do we seek personal development? Like, really sit down and think about that for a moment. Like, why do we seek personal development? We want to be happier. We want to be more at peace. So the question to ask yourself is at what point are these tools, people, support systems doing that? And at what point is it getting so out of control that now you just feel worse? Right? There's a few other pieces to this as well that are important, right? Like, and again, there's this crossover between like faith, purity, perfectionism, and like culty behavior. And I feel like just the, the cult piece and the culty behavior is like its own whole episode, perhaps. I might go into that more, but it does feel connected to this conversation as well. And that is like the, 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 the amount of self-indulgence and narcissism that is being propagated by systems like social media, right? When on a daily basis, we are being asked as part of our marketing strategy to document everything about ourselves, to talk about, oh, hey, here's what's on my schedule today. Oh, hey, look at me. I went and um, had a fabulous lunch with like three other influencer coaches and like, oh, look at me. I, you know, have this car and do this thing. And it's just like, there is a level of presentational and um, self-absorbent. You know, it's not even like someone can have zero narcissistic tendencies and social media can start to evoke narcissistic behavior, self-indulgent behavior, whatever word you want to use. I'm using these words to essentially talk about the, the concept of the world revolves around me. And so we become that person when 
so much of our programming is like, I must document something. I see this with myself because I'm horrible at Instagram. And I am constantly feeling guilt. It's so hard for me to extract this because I know I'm being played. And yet I feel constant guilt that I'm not someone who pulls out their phone and records different shit because I know that it is going to impact my business, which then impacts my livelihood. And yet, like my body, I just can't do it. I can't do it because I know it's going to rewire my brain and I am not willing. I will leave money on the table to keep my brain intact. That's just like a personal thing. But I can feel it creeping into my own psyche. So I just wonder what's going on for other people who are documenting every day and who are posting every day and who are feeling like they need to keep up with what is the latest trend and like what are we doing now? Are we doing like five second reels? Are we doing 20 second reels? What's the like latest track that everyone is putting so that they're, you know, they get bumped up on the algorithm and then, you know, it's all about me, 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 me. And what happens is we go into a certain tunnel vision where the world is about that. And not because we're necessarily selfish or self-indulgent or even narcissistic in any way, but because the system starts to create that. It creates new neural pathways. The same way more and more people are like, I have ADHD and I have this and I can't focus on anxiety. It's like, why does that exist now? Because of our the world we're living in because of the systems that are at play because of the way that we're engaging in the world throughout the day i'm sure all of us have more scoliosis and more chiropractic issues too because we're looking down at a phone all day right like these are the different things that are starting to creep up in our physical and mental health that aren't our fault as individuals but we need to start claiming responsibility for how we are letting it happen to us because this is no joke. It is changing the entire collective mental health and physical health. And so it's really, really important to just start to notice how there is this parallel between that self-indulgent behavior, that me, me, me ethos that is naturally being evoked through just social media. And then how when we look at these different religious leaders, the different cults, the different um, communities that have, you know, someone that then gets pedestaled, that person usually has a me, me, me energy as well. And so we are creating these like watered down culty energies and communities in the social media realm. And similar to a cult, the people who choose to be in a cult, right? Like there's all this controversy around like, well, didn't you see what was going on? And it's such a subtle step-by-step, play-by-play situation that people who when you really look at how they slowly implement and start to close off the community and brainwash the community, you start to understand that, oh, anyone can be a victim of this. Anyone who may think that they are critical thinkers and sovereign beings can still end up in this herd mentality, which is again, part of the human inclination and something that I'm just getting curious about. Like, I just feel that this next chapter of a lot of my work is about herd mentality. And, you know, we saw it with COVID. We're seeing it here. Like, it's just something that happens all the time under a political leader, religious leader, a coach who, you know, and when I say coach, like it's mainly influencer coaches uh, because that's the platform they have now. But it could also be like a small, a little, a uh, little local community, right? It doesn't have to be this big online thing. I mean, I know that the closest thing that I got to, to culty behavior that isn't just through like someone else, but me myself getting sucked into something was a situation where I was a part of a business 
that was pedestaling the founder. And the and we had a very strong community. And it was pulling people in based on a beautiful thing, but it started to rot from the inside side out. And it was each year it got worse and worse and worse. And I started to pull away because I saw what was happening and I was absolutely unavailable to be involved, but I really believed in the modality and I really believed and saw the results it was giving to the people that I was working with. And so eventually that whole world crumbled. Um, luckily, the modality sort of stayed alive in its own way, but um, that was the closest I got where I saw that there was one person who, you know, founded this business and founded this modality who was very, very, very into herself and who needed, there was something psychologically in her, like she needed to be fed by admiration and reverence. And so there was a close circle of people that started to form that would just bat their eyelashes at her and just were like obsessed, right? Um, they wouldn't probably refer to it as that, but it essentially had that little bit of a culty energy. And I was like, wow, I'm watching this happen and I'm going, uh, 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 I will not get involved in this. And so I distanced myself from that. And years later, there was, you know, crazy expose. And of course, the inner circle was like, oh, my God, there was so much manipulation and abuse and gaslighting. And, and I was like, I'm not surprised. And that wasn't even a cult. Like, that was just literally a business. But that's an example of how there are so many organizations and businesses and communities where there is, like, cult-like behavior. I have never gone to... Uh, an ISTA retreat. However, I have heard quite some interesting things. And that I would say is probably, like I said, I haven't had firsthand experience of this. But my understanding is there are certain, to me, when I think about ISTA, I think it's very similar to um, the orgasm, one taste, right? Nicole de Don and the orgasmic meditation community. There was a whole documentary made on that. We had, I mean, there's so many people, right? There's Teal Swan with her, her whole group of people. There was, you know, Bikram from Bikram Yoga and his whole uh, clan. And those are, none of those were technically considered a cult per se. But if you think about it, it's a similar thing. Like they come together for something that probably is actually makes a lot of sense and like a lot of us believe in. And um, it preys, again, sometimes unintentionally on the insecurities and the not enoughness. And then it gives you the answer, which is pay, pay money that's going to absolve you. That is going to make you more pure. That is going to fix your problems, right? And just something for us to really look at. It's time for us to look underneath the surface and go, what is actually going on? But my prayer is that we can do it in a subtle, nuanced way, that we're not going full into cancel culture. Because the answer is not even though some of these individuals are practicing really uninformed, like trauma uninformed and like manipulative, like patriarchal practices that suck, like those people should not be taken down by the mob. Like that's just something that I just, I feel like the cancel culture thing is just so, ugh, I'm just a no to it on all levels. Um, but what we can do is find the middle ground and be better. I think a lot of coaches I saw in last year or two are like, I'm leaving the coaching industry. This sucks. Listen, I get it. I was, I was, I have a level of fatigue right now with the marketing practices that is having me want to fully quit and leave and just walk away. But something keeps pulling me back because I believe in coaching so deeply. And I'm like, if we all leave, if the good ones leave, the ones who are paying attention, who are thinking critically, who are trying to 
create more sustainable practices, which means we leave money on the table all the fucking time because we're trying to be in more integrity and truth because ultimately peace and happiness is what's most important. And we know that money is not what's going to give us that. But it's hard. It's a hard battle to run a business in integrity that's sustainable, that takes into account the holistic Uh, practices and the community and the ecosystem of your business and the ecosystem that you operate your business in, which includes planet Earth, like doing that is not easy, is the harder route. But if we quit in the face of that challenge, all we leave is just the disgusting, you know, commodification of not enoughness and I refuse to do that so if there's coaches listening here I hope that you feel the same way and that you don't leave because there has been a mass exodus there will be a mass exodus it's happening but I hope that those who are leaving are leaving because they're really meant to be doing something else and those who stay are saying, you know what, it's going to be hard, but I'm sticking around to make this space truly more safe for people. Not in a bubble wrappy coddling kind of way, but to truly allow it to be safe and sustainable and beautiful and for it to support true peace and happiness, which was the original reason why we got into personal development in the first place. So. And all of this, I mean, it ties also into, I feel like the perfectionism piece also ties into like this good, bad binary. So I don't know if this is worth getting into much more because I feel like I've covered it, but just a point that I had written down as well was, you know, there is this like, we do still have a binary. There's like, oh, if like, there's just good and and bad in the rhetoric and the language. And it's just, it needs to stop. It's as simple as that. Like we are trying our best to be happier. And you know what? It's freaking hard right now. (laughs) This is a hard time in history to be at peace. Life is expensive. Everyone's having like existential meltdowns, which I think ultimately is a good thing, but right now it doesn't feel so great. We are questioning everything. It's a weird time. Relationships, I feel like romantic relationships are just falling apart. People are equally lonely, but also isolating. <laughs> and then they're they're sad that they're lonely. And I'm like, but you're also isolating. But it's really hard not to isolate when things are so hard. So it's just this, like, there's all these, like, loops and things and mechanisms happening inside of us that we have to be really compassionate and patient with ourselves on. But the answer is not good or bad as a philosophy, and the answer is not being more regimented. Again, going back to culty behavior, regimen is one of the number one ways that cults keep their power. They're like, you eat this type of food, you only, you know, you don't eat this stuff, you wake up and do yoga or ice baths or whatever you're doing, and if you don't do that, you are a bad person. (laughs) Okay, I would like to point to a lot of the older generation in the Middle East where I grew up, where people were smoking packs of cigarettes, eating all sorts of weird food, and living to 99. Do you think they were taking thousands of dollars of supplements? I I take thousands of dollars of supplements and I question every single day, like, is there any improvement in my life? Like, I'm not even sure. Other than losing thousands of dollars. Like, am I being duped into regimented behavior? Like, somehow this is going to be better? And I don't have, there's no black or white answer. I'm in the inquiry. Is this supporting my longevity in my and also do is does longevity even support my peace and my happiness like do I want to live to 99 
Or do I want to have a really fucking good time and go out and eat a baguette and some wine and do it the French way who apparently lives, I think, they have one of the longest lifespans from what I remember when I saw the stats. And they're eating croissants and cheese and drinking wine at noon and lots of espressos. So there's no right or wrong. Every body needs a different thing. But the question is to, like, the most important thing is to question and ask and just think critically and to not allow the prosperity preachers of the coaching industry to guilt you into a thousand dollar vow of faith. Because that is just a bunch of bullshit. So that's today's episode. I love you guys so much. Thank you for listening. We would love for you to rate and review the show. And I'd love to know your takeaways from the episode. You can do that by DMing me on Instagram at Nadia Munlaf.